actually, I'm from Hawaii and Alabama. That's how I look at it. I was born in Hawaii. I won't tell you how long ago, but you know, a long time ago. I grew up in Alabama. I went to high school in Hawaii and college in Alabama. So I have a birth certificate from Hawaii, a high school diploma from Hawaii, and a college degree from Auburn University, Montgomery in Alabama. So that's where I spent the first 22 years of my life. And then I spent 20 years here in Atlanta, 10 years as the Atlanta Java User Group president. So I've been doing a lot of stuff in this community. And then I moved about four or five years ago to Raleigh as part of the Red Hat team. When JBoss was acquired by Red Hat, I was part of the JBoss team at that time, and I moved up to Red Hat. And now I'm in product management, which if you, um, if you work for a vendor, then that has a very specific meaning. If you don't work for a vendor, it may or may not mean much to you. But I like to think of myself as the product owner in a Scrum team, except that we're all open source projects and Scrum is certainly not followed. Yes, sir? What city in Alabama? Oh, I was uh, Prattville, Alabama primarily, little town outside of um, Montgomery. Daniel Pratt, named after, because he brought the first cotton gin to Prattville, Alabama. And before that, Sylacaug, Alabama. So talk about craziness. All right, I'm going to actually start off, start off with showing you guys a demo because it's actually working and it didn't work earlier. Um, I'll have to tell you, you, I have a lot of stuff. You guys are welcome to come see this afterwards. I'm going to try to show it here with this little camera. But we have um, hardware is hard because you've got to get through security at the airport with all this stuff. <laughs> but I'm going to show you this right here, and I'll try to explain it. So I don't know if you can see right there. Uh, let's get a little bit closer. All right. So I'm, I'm going to, if you notice right there, it says Beacon 251. Do you guys see that? And it also says Burr Sutter. All right. That's because Burr Sutter is a little too close here. Let's see if I can hold my hand over it and cover them up a little bit. There we go. All right. So 251 is the one that's sitting on top of the scanner right now. So that little blue thing right there is a Bluetooth beacon. All right. And this, this scanner is picking up 251. If I take 251 away and put the one that this one's mapped to my name. All right, and it should then go back to Burr. 251 is still a little too close. I haven't tuned this scanner that well yet, so if I cover it up. So this is Bluetooth technology, Bluetooth Low Energy. And all right, so you guys are thinking, okay, what, why is that cool? So this thing operates on a watch battery, basically a little thin watch battery. Um, it base, it's nothing in size or shape. Here, I'll, I'll pass this around. Let, pass that around, let people see it. Um, and actually, this whole thing is running on a battery, so I can move this whole thing around. And what it's doing is looking for the Bluetooth signals, all right? Looking for the Bluetooth signals coming from that chip right here in my hand. And the reason that's important is you can use this Bluetooth signature to do some really cool stuff. So anybody with a Fitbit, we can know where you are. It's the same kind of technology. So it's, uh, Bluetooth at low energy is 2.4 gigahertz technology, just like Wi-Fi. It has an advertising packet that emits that a with a unique identifier that basically says who you are. That way, if you wish to pair with it, right, you kind of know who it is, right? Is it my Fitbit that I want to pair with or my Bluetooth keyboard or whatever it might be? But what we did is we took these little dongles, right, these little Bluetooth um, uh, uh, chips. We put them on people's badges at Red Hat Summit uh, this past year. So we actually ran a production IoT system at Summit, and let me, I'm going to run a video for you because so you can see the results of this. We basically put 300 of these things in play. We attached them to people throughout the conference. And if you look here, uh, it'll actually show you it from early in the morning. There's very few people in the building, but people are starting to gather in the breakfast room, which is on the third floor. All right, so everybody's at breakfast. And then you'll see people have their breakfast and whatnot. Then they show up in the breakout sessions down below here. Right, and you can see them moving around the breakout sessions. And then as we get ready for our keynote presentation, which is where we showed all this uh, when we were in the keynote, you'll see that they all show up in the general session over here. And you can kind of see as people are in different breakout sessions, the check-in, check-outs, right? You guys see all that as well? So this, this, by the way, this video is up on YouTube. I've already submitted it there. But so those check-in, check-outs are based on the relative position of that Bluetooth beacon and the scanners we set up that look just like the scanner you see here holding my hand. And so it's just a Raspberry Pi with a, uh, a Wi-Fi chip, a Bluetooth chip, and that's it. And in this case, we added an LCD just to show you which beacon is picking up right now. But the, that's certainly optional. You know, that was just kind of a nice have. And I stuck this on a battery. This is one of those batteries you charge your iPad or iPhone with. That's it, right? So this whole setup here is less than 100 bucks, and I have a way to scan Bluetooth signatures, <laughs> as an example. Um, so we actually, uh, you'll notice those two right there were competing with each other. If I actually threw one to the back of the room, it would actually work, work better. So we were finding somewhere between 30 feet to 100 feet pretty consistently. Uh, we actually thought they were more powerful than we thought they would be. 
And this was all production data that we used when we were tracking people around the system. So basically, all those, method, all, all those events went into our message broker. So the message broker we're, we're sponsoring these days at Red Hat is ActiveMQ. You guys probably heard of ActiveMQ, Apache ActiveMQ. We collected well over 7 million events in just a few hours that you saw this time window. This is probably about 8 to 9 million events when I actually did this recording late in the day. Um, and then we actually processed all those through Apache Spark, so Apache Spark streaming, to basically figure out what rooms you were in. All we did was basically put a scanner in each one of these rooms, couple up here, one over in the breakfast room, uh, and that was it. So we had a, a real live IoT system for actually tracking movement of real material objects throughout a really large building for, I, we spent about $2,000, because these are five bucks each. We didn't even, we couldn't even get the company to talk to us, so I just expensed it, <laughs> just bought it. Um, so that, that concept is pretty powerful. And from an IoT use case standpoint, the ability to know where your ultrasound machines are in your hospital could be very important. The ability to know where very specialized tooling is in your manufacturing organization could be very important. You want to know where your forklifts are in your big cross-stock warehouse. We have several cross-stock warehouses here in Atlanta. Prior to being a software guy, I, I, I was a software guy for manufacturing and distribution companies here in Atlanta. That's where I got started 20 years ago. And so if you think about all those physical things that you might, that move, that you might wish to track, where GPS is not appropriate, because these things live inside buildings. Ultrasounds aren't running around on the streets. They're running around in a big old 10-story building. Can't use GPS in that use case, nor can you use GPS for this use case in a big old concrete conference center. So you have to think that through. It's like, that's a pretty powerful concept if you think about it, and you can do it very, very inexpensively. Um, and yeah, so it's still, good, good news is still working here. So how do you find positions? I didn't get that. You triangulate it? No, no, uh, so by default, so right here, again, it's registering birth setter on that. You can kind of see my name there. So one, th one thing I just set up before we went out, uh, before we started, I have my own router up here, which actually is bridging through my phone to get out to the internet. So that birth setter is actually coming from a REST endpoint out in the cloud. <laughs> I wasn't sure if that was going to work or not. Um, so the Bluetooth signature basically is collected by the Bluetooth dongle, this little guy right here, right? So that's all it is. So he's basically grabbing the advertising packets from the Bluetooth device. Any Bluetooth device would work, but we're looking for specific user uh, UUIDs with specific major minors. And one of the things it'll do, and, and this is just standard Bluetooth spec, you can calculate what's called an RSSI, RSSI. And that's an approximation of signal strength and approximation of distance. So that's the magic. So you're going to use this for all, this has huge impacts on the retail industry. I want to know where my consumers are, customers are within my overall building. I want to be able to do digital signage just for them, personalized digital signage, personalized virtual assistance. If the salesperson walks up to you, they can say, well, hello, Mr. Sutter. We see you're looking at stereos today. Would you like some assistance with your stereo? So this is where the world of retail might be able to go. Um, so it sounds very spooky, right? Uh, people can track every movement you make, but you have a smartphone in your pocket, it's too late. <laughs> All right, well, let's, um, let's dive into the presentation. There's a lot more to show, but I just wanted to show that demo because it was actually running at that moment. It didn't run for me earlier. Um, but again, hardware is very hard. So we're going to use some slides. Um, and then hopefully, and, and again, on, back on that video, hopefully that made some sense. Uh, and maybe I didn't quite articulate it well enough for you to understand the use case. But this is insanely powerful. I don't know how to, I don't want to oversell it. But if you're a marketing person, you want to know who's moving around your conference, this is, ins this is awesome, right? This is a big, big win for conference organizers, as an example. Yes, sir? I'm sorry, uh, so. Oh, the, the scanner concept? Mm -hmm. I mean, this, I mean, the, the Raspberry Pi right here is basically its own Linux server, so. Um, I don't think I would probably put it in a, like, let's say a web server or a, you know, a, uh, whatever it is, my messaging broker or my application server, uh, you know, a data grid node. I don't think I would do that sort of thing with it. Uh, it's, I really see it more for this kind of context where I have a little mini Linux computer that I want to run on a battery, let's say, uh, or in this case, I could actually just use it for sniffing purposes by walking around, you know. So um, I was sitting on the plane the other day. You could basically just look for everyone's Fitbit signatures as an example see who's wearing a Fitbit, then you can kind of track their movements within a physical space. You do have to have enough of these, though, to do that sort of thing. And uh, I have another example we'll, we'll give you in a second. So let's, um, let's just jump right in here. 
And this is how this whole presentation is going to go, by the way. It's kind of chaotic. <laughs> Just, I'm warning you now. Uh, all right. So the, the enterprise developer's journey, I started researching IoT stuff uh, fall of last year. I started working with all kinds of different hardware. I wanted to see exactly how you put things together. I would originally started with just breadboarding, and then I learned how to solder, and then I just started hacking all kinds of craziness. Because um, I really wanted to understand what it means to build applications to work within the context of an IoT solution. I am a traditional enterprise Java developer primarily, though I do a lot of Node.js these days also. Uh, so a lot of the demos I have here are based on Node.js as an example. Uh, but you will also be doing a lot of C, C++ in this world, right? So you've got to get back to the C stuff that you may have took, took in college but didn't touch again. Uh, and that's certainly been my story. I haven't really done C programming uh, since I was in college. You know, this is like 25 years ago about. <laughs> so I had to relearn C, and I'm still relearning C in this world. So I consider this an enterprise developer's journey because it's my own personal journey. And I do think it reflects how you guys might encounter this and, and think about it. And what I really want you guys to do is just kind of open your minds to what the possibilities are. All right? What could I do now that I can touch the physical world? As software people, we've never interacted with the physical world other than a mouse and a keyboard. That's it. That's the only physicality our software's ever been integrated with, if you think about it. And for some of you guys who do purely back, back end stuff, right? You don't even have a mouse or keyboard to interact with. All you get is transactions through a wire of some sort, whether it be RMI over IOP, or spring remoting, or you know, web sockets, or restful calls over HTTP. Right? You don't even see a keyboard or mouse anymore. Now we can actually touch any physical thing in the physical world, and it can touch us. So you have to kind of open your mind to this concept. And it's actually pretty profound. And so I used to poo-poo the idea that you know, the, the, it's, we're at the top of the hype curve for IoT. So 2014 here, you probably can't read that small font, but it basically says Internet of Things. Great, and I lost the mouse already. Um, oh, I didn't have the screen flow thing. You want me to the screen flow thing too? I thought it was on. Yeah, I probably forgot. Let's do that. Uh, now I got to start all over again. No, I'm just no, kidding. It, it was on. I don't think it's recording though. Du -du -du. Let's see what it'll do. Yeah, we'll let it record. Um, but I threw this Gartner hype cycle in here because for many of you guys, I know what you're thinking. You're like, it's all hype. Yes, it's all hype. But I personally don't have a problem with hype. If, come on. This is a LibreOffice on Mac problem. The mouse disappears sometimes. Open source software. Um, so here, if you look at the Internet of Things, at the top of the hype curve from Gartner's standpoint, what, there, the hype is actually an okay thing. You can say, no, no, it's just hype. I don't care. I don't care about this Internet of Things thing because it's all hype. But there's all kinds of things that have been very hyped that have, have had a profound impact on our, our ecosystem and our world. As an example, if you just look back a couple years, there was, and great, the mouse is gone again. If you look back a couple years, you'll see this thing called, uh, you know, like big data. How many people here have some form of big data or Hadoop installation that they've been working with in their company now? Okay, so there's a handful of you, and I know Chris actually gave a presentation like five, six years ago on what could be done with Hadoop and things like that. So he was an early adopter of that technology, and it was a huge impact on Silverpop. Do you know Silverpop was still, still using the Hadoop installation? Yeah, we're part of IBM now, so it's uh, more the IBM stuff. Okay, okay. Uh, another example that's on this chart is cloud computing. How many people here have run something in production on some form of cloud software at this point? All right. So that would be Amazon, Microsoft, Google, OpenStack, on-premise private cloud, VMware, you know, name your, name your you know, version of that. Cloud computing has kind of been a big deal, too. Now, for the rest of you who didn't raise your hand, you're like, wow, that cloud computing is all hype. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so is big data. It's all hype. So is IT, IoT. It's all hype. The hype precedes the productivity often by years. That's what this chart tries to represent. At the top of the hype curve is when everyone's talking about it. That's what gets the industry moving. And then two, five, ten years later, people adopt that technology. That's just kind of the way it works. And so that's why I make the note of this slide here. Um, I don't consider it to be that important. But just know that we're very early in the cycle right now. All right? But now is the opportunity for you as an engineer, you as a developer, to start experimenting, to start learning about this stuff. And then you can decide how it might impact your world, right? Your world for your business. If you work for, let's say, a Home Depot here in town, this has a huge impact on what Home Depot would be doing in the future. Like I mentioned several retail examples already. 
um, as, as for example. But if you work for UPS, right, you've already done a big rollout of very smart devices that you gave to all the truck drivers who actually deliver the packages uh, to the actual home. So the, the IoT concept is very big and popular right now, but the machine to machine is what preceded this, they call it M to M, has been around for a long, long time. Okay? So before software ate the world, we used to make things, we used to ship things, we used to buy things. And, and some of you are thinking, things? What are things? All right, so I asked this question in all my other presentations. We'll see how many uh, raised their hand here. How many people here work for a software company or a financial services company? Okay, so at least 66% of you. So you guys don't have any things, right? <laughs> Software companies and financial services companies, like whether it be banks or insurance, et cetera, you don't really have a lot of things. So that's one thing that's kind of odd to me, because I actually started my career working with manufacturing and distribution companies. They're all about the things, right? Movement of physical things, making of physical things, and selling them to actual humans. So for all, the, all you folks who don't touch any physical things anymore, just think about the things you might like to buy one day. That might be the closest thing, <laughs> to the closest way you come towards this physical world. But this thing over here in the left-hand corner is an Allen Bradley device. It's a PLC, right? Programmable Logic Controller. If you actually walked into a large factory that was very well automated, you would see a lot of these components sitting at the various stages on the manufacturing line, and they would be used to decide, you know, make decisions about the quality of that thing that's at this particular stage, tell you what bolt to put in the right spot, maybe even put the bolt with a robot into the right spot so a human doesn't have to do it, right? So the PLC has been out there for a lot of years. Alan Bradley is one of the kingpins of that universe, as is Siemens. Uh, and that's a world that, if, depending on where you come from, you've spent a lot of time with these devices, right? You would normally program these things in C also, and they have their own proprietary tools and technologies, depending on what vendor you go with. Um, one of my favorites here is this vending machine you see on the left-hand side here. This is a scrubs vending machine. If you're in a large hospital, you have all your nurses and doctors and whatnot, and they all get little outfits to wear. You guys have seen those outfits before? You probably laughed at them when you went to the doctor's office, like, why are you wearing pajamas, right? Those are things called scrubs, and they actually have a vending machine that's actually very intelligent so that you actually have a certain allocation as a nurse or a doctor that you get for free each month, that's your quota, if you will, and you scan your card, right, and then you get the next set of clothing out of the vending machine that you take with you, right? So they're vending clothing, as an example. So in the hospital world, they have a lot of physical things, too, all the equipment, as an, as an example, in a hospital. Uh, so any kind of warehouse like you see there in the middle, that's my portable ultrasound machine there in the lower left-hand corner. And again, my mouse is gone here, my ultrasound machine. There used to be these things called trucks that went out into the world at large, and me, they, people used to go up poles and things like that. Those are all examples of things, all right? And I'm, I'm kind of being facetious here because I notice I'm a software guy, too, and if you come from a pure software background, it, you have to stretch your mind again. It's like, do they mean there's more than a mouse and a keyboard? Yes, there's a lot more things in the physical world than a mouse and a keyboard that you can now interact with. The, the, my favorite one here is the Magic Band. So this is a reported $1 billion expenditure by Disney, right? Disney spent a billion dollars to build not just the band, design the hardware, but build out the entire enterprise infrastructure system to support the Magic Band across their parks. A billion dollar investment that's been widely reported. They, spent, they actually built this in a little think tank, I believe it was in Orlando, a uh, little small actually part of the park. And they, they and then invited all their executive team in to let them experience what the Magic Band could do to transform Disney, the Disney physical parks. Their ultimate goal is to get rid of turnstiles. They'll just happen to know when you're on the property. So they do this through two technologies. One is RFID. Right, so that's where you kind of scan the watch, uh, sorry, the, the band to let you into your room to pay for your food. It'll actually pre-order your food when you walk in the door, so you can just sit anywhere you like and they'll bring the food to your table. These are things they're already doing with this technology. And, the, the, and one of the things they're about to do, so there's actually, if you look up, if you Google for Disney Magic Band Teardown, there's actually two things in this. There's an RFID chip, which is a passive chip with no power, and there's a 2.4 gigahertz radio with a small battery in there as well. So it's exactly the same technology I just showed you here. So these things can get very small. And as a matter of fact, if I crack this open, the majority of what's in here is the battery. The chip itself is nearly microscopic. Okay? So they basically have put one of these, uh, it's not a Bluetooth radio from what I can tell, it's just a 2.4 gigahertz, but that's just one step below Bluetooth, if you know what I mean, it's 2.4 gigahertz radio. They can now do things like know where you are in the park, just like we did in that conference center. That's not a use case they've started talking about yet. But the one thing they're going to do is interactive rides. They know it's you. They know what seat you're on in the ride. And they'll, uh, the one use case they're looking at right away is take the picture of you on the ride. You, 
Yeah, uh, and they're going to also try to figure out how to more interactions from the ride standpoint. So it's transforming Disney as an example, and this is a, just an interesting use case. Also tracking where all the people are moving, so that they don't have to have a full hundred percent staff that can do a smaller staff. And when they see the people moving to maybe the Magic Kingdom or not that per, certain part of Magic Kingdom, they reapportion staff to that area okay. where everybody's at. And then when people move to another area, they move them so they can close down and race. We we'll sell T-shirts over here instead of over there. Exactly. Mm -hmm. we sell so hot dogs over there. there. That's a huge feature. The really feature. cool one they have is on the test track drive by GM. Yeah. You you create a car with software as part of your interactive before, and then they capture the stats of the car you built on the track of the test and okay. compete against other people in your car for the best performing car. Neat, neat, neat. So these are some, so I didn't know about these two, two use cases. I've been specifically looking at the Magic Band and what's in it. So it's actually a Nordic semiconductor chip. I've been learning about chips and silicon things like that, and those things are cheap, cheap, cheap to buy. You can have all kinds of fun with this. Chris, do you have a? Uh, you you were talking about in retail with the marketer knowing where you are, but one example is a better use case, which is optimizing staff. Bunch of people's, well, not just minimal staff, but staff. How many people are standing in the front of the checkout lines? Automatically alert and send people before somebody has to pick up all cashiers to the front. They already know and they've been notified the radio to start coming. Through. It's better if you just check out anywhere in the store, like at the Apple store. No, yeah. <laughs> Let's keep going. <laughs> lots, lots of, I have lots of content. Yes, sir. I have a quick question. I guess this technology, I mean, it's still new to me, but I was just thinking whatever you just said um, that relates to a cell phone and finding a car. Because I know that some. Maybe some Apple product has already finding a car, like finding your lost car yeah, in the parking yeah, lot. For example, I parked my car somewhere else right there right. in the parking lot, but now you know I was like, "Where's my car now?" Right. How can you get it with that? In that case, for that particular use, so it's all by use case, right? In that particular use case, I'd still use the GPS capability of the smartphone that it already has. You know that your consumer has a smartphone with them at all times. Therefore, when they leave their car, they can hit the button on their app, right, which would mark that particular point on the parking lot. And then when they leave the mall or whatever, they can kind of say, hey, app, where's my car? Uh, so that actually wouldn't be hard to do at all. Uh, there's probably at least 10 apps in the App Store that do that already. Um, and so I was thinking because the cell phone itself has GPS and Bluetooth. I mean, it has everything, right? Yeah. So it has an accelerometer, a gyroscope. It has, uh, uh, some, I think some of the Samsung ones have a barometer in it. So I have all those sensors and stuff here. But this, is, of course, is a $600 device. Um, so you have to kind of decide, is that something you want to field? And there are people literally fielding this as their thing. They don't mind spending six, seven, eight hundred dollars a device because for them, they're getting the return on that investment. For the stuff I'm actually showing here, these things are under fifty dollars and they're getting down into the single digits of dollars. So if you got to deploy, let's say, ten thousand of them, it's more economical. So you can literally, if you actually broke all the chips out of this and just took the ones you want, you can get that down to five bucks. You know, so you just have to decide what, what is it worth to you. Um, couple, this, I, I put this slide together, and I know you guys can't read it specifically, but I try to put things in context of history just because I kind of think about my own career path and what I'm looking at at the moment. And so if you, if you actually look at, you know, 30 years ago, we actually built green screen applications, right, for VT2, VT100, VT220, maybe you did 5250 or 3270 if you come from the IBM world, right? And that was a block mode or character mode, uh, Chewy, I called it, character user interface. And the real delta, though, the real change was back when you built those apps for your manufacturing or distribution or retail or whatever it was, and they're still using a lot of these apps in production today, these, uh, in, in many cases, if you were the customer, as, let's say you were a warehouse owner or manufacturing owner, you would call your sales rep for the vendor and say, hey, I need replenishment on product X. The sales rep would write it on a, f a piece of paper and fax it into the back office people in Cincinnati. The back office person would take the fax, read it, squint at it a little bit and say, I think this is what the sales rep meant. Type it into the green screen mainframe style application. A lot of it was Unix back then, you know, maybe pyramid systems. And then they would jam that into the system, and then a couple weeks later, the product would ship to that customer. And the problem was the numerous opportunities for error, right? Not to mention the inefficiency where we could probably have done something differently. And we moved over to this world of GUI, and we said we had client server systems, right? And we told the sales rep, hey, we now made this a GUI thing on Windows. You have a Windows desktop PC. You put the order in, in our Visual Basic Power Builder super 
uh, SQL Gupta Windows or Gupta SQL Windows application. You put the order in, Mr. Sales Rep, and we can eliminate the back office person as an example. Then we went to the web. We told the customer, you put the order in, Mr. Customer. Don't even talk to the sales rep. You order in your web browser exactly what you want, and therefore we eliminate the sales rep and the back office person and those opportunities for error, right? Not to mention the fax transmission maybe it got lost along the way. And then we went to the world of mobile. We said, hey, don't even come back to your desk, Mr. Customer. As you're walking around your plant, use your phone to say, oh, I need more of product X. And that would get into our system. And so now in the world of things, we're simply saying the person doesn't have to be involved at all. The machine that's out of product X knows it's out of product X. It'll put the order in automatically, bypassing all humans completely and eliminating all possibilities for error. Now, you guys are thinking, oh my god, I saw this in Terminator. Right. <laughs> But that, but that is the nature of what we're trying to do. We're trying to automate all things, right? And you are part of, you're part of bringing about the future of Terminator already if you're writing code of any sort. We're about automating all things. I've got to move along a little faster here. Um, so my personal developer journey is trying to understand what is possible with all this technology. What kinds of things can I interact with in the physical world? What kind of things can interact with me? You also need to make friends. If you're a Java developer, you actually do not have enough of the skills yet to pull this off. Now, I, now I have one key question. In Atlanta, it was pretty interesting many, many years ago, but how many people here have an electrical engineering degree, actually? All right, a number of you, fantastic. So, but you're now a software person, you know? And I remember back in like 1999, all the electrical engineers wanted to be software people instead because that's where the money was, right? Well, guess what? If you're an EE, the money's over in this new world, you can go back to being an EE again, all right? So, what you want to what you want to find is make friends with some electrical engineers, some mechanical engineers, and embedded engineers. And there's actually relatively few of those people that have the right skill set. The estimation for embedded engineers on the in the globe right now is about a million. There's 10 million of us, one million of them. There, the world now needs three million of them. So where are those extra two to three million going to come from? We don't know yet, right? So somebody's got to move into that space and understand how to build this kind of hardware and software infrastructure, how to build firmware, if you will, for some of these devices. Or you can just do JavaScript in the browser. Okay? So right here, I filmed myself in the experimentation and prototyping phase. I'm just trying to see how many things I can connect and how to connect them, and more, most importantly, how to connect them to enterprise software. Right? I'm not really doing anything for home automation. I've done actually zero stuff for home automation. I've not, I don't have any wearables. I don't have any of the fun stuff, actually. I'm all about trying to figure out how to connect things to enterprise software in some form or fashion. So these are, I'm looking through very specific use cases that would impact your business, whatever it might be. If you're a Delta, a UPS, a Home Depot, or a small consulting company that works for South Trust, uh, SunTrust here in, in, in the Atlanta area, or any of those other companies, right? This is what might impact them. Um, if you get really hardcore about this, though, you can actually design the whole physical product and the firmware and the software back in infrastructure, and you can ship that. You know, if I wanted to ship this thing, I wouldn't say it's very pretty. I could put a plastic case on it, ship it. This might be something very useful to somebody, as an example. Uh, and the cool thing is, since it is a Linux box, you can SSH into it, so it's actually not hard to manage. Um, but that might be something you want to ship, but I wouldn't recommend it. It's kind of unattractive. What you'll probably end up doing when you get pretty good at this is you'll design your own custom PCB. So printed circuit board. So printed circuit board, uh, where's my little camera at? Just to kind of, yeah, printed circuit board, and this is our Arduino Uno, right? The PCB is that blue thing there with all the chips and stuff on it. Um, but you will design a custom PCB at some point, if this is where you really want to go, with just the components you need. Right? Like I mentioned earlier, this thing has dozens of components in it and it costs six, seven hundred dollars, or you can just take the ones you want and make the device for ten bucks if that's what you need. Right? I just want a GPS and a cell phone radio or whatever. Those are actually two of the most expensive pieces, unfortunately, especially uh, the 4G LTE stuff. Right? That's the most expensive component typically of one of these devices other than the screen. Uh, but when it comes to the accelerometer, you can get those for pennies. Right? And gyroscopes, you know, maybe a buck, right? You can really, you can do, actually save a lot of money depending on what you want to buy. And actually, let me pass this around. So this is the Arduino Uno, if you don't want. Just let everyone kind of get a feel for it. It is the grandfather, if you will, that have, has, I would actually say, has kind of kicked off this revolution. Now, everybody with 35 bucks in their pocket can buy a microcontroller and program it for the very first time to interact with the physical world. 
All right, and it's all open source software and open source hardware, and it's absolutely revolutionizing the, the entire industry in my mind. Every big vendor out there now has to say things like, oh, we're Arduino compatible, because most people are coming to them saying, hey, I know how to do an Arduino, how do I use your cool chips and silicon and tools, as an example. Um, so that's an example of a PCB. And then if you really want to get hardcore, uh, if you're a Bitcoin miner, <laughs> Uh, the concept of an FPGA, so some of our EE folks, right? You guys remember field programmable gate arrays? Yeah, I still don't know how to do one of these things, and I don't ever plan to probably at this point. But you basically can make your own microchip is how I look at it. <laughs> and you can determine exactly what you want that microchip to do. And actually, I, I've, I went out, I've gone out and made friends with the local embedded engineering group, the robotics group, and people like that that are working in the space. They're just like us software people. They're just like us cloud, you know, app servery people. It's just that they work at a different layer of the stack. Okay? So just be aware of that. Some real high-level architecture. This is again a high-level architecture. How do you actually integrate this stuff into your average data center? So let's say you do have a thousand servers uh, working for whatever um, Macy's is, federated department stores, is that what they call themselves? Something like I can't remember. I saw, it. but they're over, you know, where I used to live, up in Duluth or something of that nature, right? Let's say they have a thousand servers or UPS or Home Depot, or whatever, and they have this big old data center. Well, at some point, you got to get this data into the data center. That's where people want to, you know, process things. So you, what you have is, uh, unfortunately, it's kind of slid off the screen here. Let's make that a little bit smaller. Uh, you have a series of sensors and actuators, right? So sensors were basically you're reading data, if you will. Right? Sucking in data from the outside world. And actuators are typically your little robotics. And think of it like uh, you, where you can touch the world. Right? So th I think it was read and write. <laughs> right? I can read or I can do something uh, to the physical world. So sensors and actuators are pretty much all you're really dealing with here. They kind of fall in those two categories. And then you have to have some form of component that we, we refer to as a, gate, a gateway. Right? That actually bridges that world, right? that physical world, into your world. And so in the case of my... Um, uh, where did my mouse go again? Whoop. You know, in the case of my Raspberry Pi here, right, the Raspberry Pi, see, if you see those two dongles there, there's the Bluetooth dongle right here by my thumb, and there's the white Wi-Pi. It's serving as my gateway. It's reading Bluetooth data, transforming that into what I need, and pushing it out over the Wi-Fi. So it's my gateway in this case. Yes, sir? It, it, you actually would notice if you start experimenting with it, you'll see it actually uh, dance. It'll go 60, 70, 60, 70, 60, 70. It's definitely not very accurate, right? If I needed to get you know, within a meter accuracy or a few meter accuracy, I'll probably go back to RFID technology than this Bluetooth technology. But, blue, but RFID is a trickier technology. Uh, it's also very inexpensive, though, RFID, uh, because you have to design your own antennas to get RFID to work. And therefore, you have to have an antenna engineer to really know how to make RFID work. At least that's what I've seen so far. For the use cases that I've had, I've had to hire, I was told, hire an antenna engineer. Yes, sir? CPU, is this on here? Yes, that's an Atmel CPU on the uh, Uno. Mm -hmm. Atmel is pretty much the key contributor to the Arduino universe, Broadcom for the Raspberry Pi universe. Then I also have Te Texas Instruments co uh, stuff up here. I also have Intel stuff up here as well. So, well, we'll just show you some things, right? So, like, look at this little guy right here. You see him? Just the green portion and the silver portion, not the red portion, ignore the red portion for now. That is a Linux server that can run Node.js, Python, Ruby, etc. You can SSH into it. I should be SSH into it right now. It has both the Bluetooth radio and Wi-Fi radio, and that's what's under the silver cover here. That's just a RF shield <laughs> to protect those radios. Uh, and you can see that's actually a, the antenna on the chip right there. That's the antenna. And the, what's behind it is actually a battery. So I am running a Linux server in the palm of my hand, it's about the size of a watch face, and I can do what I will with that, right? I can write whatever code I want to put on there, and then I can have it interact with the physical world if I choose to. So this one doesn't really do much, but we'll show you what it does in a second, all right? Uh, it does do some things, but there's no, if you notice, there's no wires from it anywhere, right? Like you see, like you see this craziness over here, like there, you get a bunch of wires. Uh, we'll show you that too. Um, so, you know, the concept of the gateway, though, is just a bridge, if you will. It's the component that figures out how to talk to the sensors, whether they be Bluetooth sensors. Like, I mostly have Bluetooth sensors here. That's what I wanted to focus my energy on. Because Wi-Fi is easy, right? Wi-Fi should be very easy for all of us here. We've all connected Wi-Fi routers typically in our homes. We're often the PC support geek for our families, right? We've helped them. We have grandma set up her router and, you know, our cousin set up their router. So Wi-Fi is no problem for most of us. 
uh, Bluetooth is a whole other challenge. And then if you go beyond Bluetooth to more industrial use cases, you're going to run into something called 802.15.4 for mesh networking, as an example. And in the case of Bluetooth or 802.15.4, you've got to bridge it into the TCP IP world. And then you connect it. And I'll show you an example of that more explicitly. Uh, but we'll jump back in here. Okay, so you got to have the gateway component out there. You then have to have some sort of ingestion system. As I mentioned earlier, with the Bluetooth signatures we were picking up at, at Red Hat Summit, with only 300 people in play, we didn't give them to everybody, just 300 people. Uh, we actually had, like I said, about seven to nine million transactions in less than 24 hours, right? So you're getting a huge amount of data in a very short period of time. We actually ran a test of that same system over the course of a few days. It got 50 million transactions. So that's just a lot of data to ingest, right? Now, the weird thing about IoT data, often the majority of it is useless to you. So there was actually, I don't see any of the gentlemen here, there was a team that worked here in town on smart uh, meters. Uh, and I met them many, many years ago, and they actually had approximately a million smart meters. They reported in approximately once a second. That's a million transactions a second. Right? <laughs> so you have to think in those kinds of terms, right? If I have that many smart meters that are reporting in their status, I get a million transactions per second, and then most of those transactions are, I'm still okay. I'm still here. And you have to kind of discard those pretty rapidly and get to the meat. What was the delta? That's what I care about the most. Is the temperature rising or falling? Is the thing moving or stationary? Is the, are they burning lots of electricity in their smart meter, or, or is the smart meter broken, or is it just, a happy smart meter. You got to think in those terms. So the analytics portion of this here, this little diagram here, is incredibly important. Yeah, I'll zoom in here. So you got to deal with the ingestion factor. You might also use a time series database right here. That's what that icon is for. And the analytics piece is very critical. So in the case of our demo we did at Summit, we actually used Apache Spark and the streaming capability you have there. Uh, that might be a solution for you. There's also Apache Storm as another solution. Spark is much more popular than Storm, but Storm is also a fine solution. You can also use our, our Drools project. has a complex event processing component in it. You could use that as an example. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to deal with streaming data and trying to find the nuggets of gold in that stream of data, right? That needle in the haystack, if you will. So you just have to determine what your analytics engine will be. And then, on the, um, and then once you have it analyzed, you then decide you're going to dashboard it you're going to start workflows on it. Like, let's say the temperature and vibration shows that that machine part in that warehouse is going to die. Send the people in the truck out to the machine in the warehouse to fix it before it does die. Because if it does die, it costs us a million dollars an hour while it's down. Factory automation is very serious. If your factory is down, that costs a lot of money. And it also means you might miss SLAs for your customers who are actually buying that inventory. Right, because now most people have gone to just-in-time inventory. You don't have a bunch of this stuff sitting on the shelf. You're making it just as the customer needs it. If the machine is down, you've got a problem. So the workflow and integration, at this point, once you've bridged it through this world, it is anything Java can do. So I primarily use ActiveMQ as the ingestion point, and Camel as the way to integrate everything else, Apache Camel. Right? So it's just as simple as that. Uh, we'll keep marching along here. OK. All right. Focus on these edge architectures. So a direct Wi-Fi connection, very straightforward. We mentioned that already. You can also do Bluetooth with Wi-Fi. That's what I did here in this little demo, right? So we bridge Bluetooth and Wi-Fi together through one device, and that allowed me to connect to other sensors that are just speaking Bluetooth. One nice thing about Bluetooth is it's incredibly low power, so you can run those things on a battery for long periods of time. Uh, TI is now advertising sensors that they can run on a Bluetooth-enabled uh, sensor for approximately 10 years. The Magic Band at Disney is advertised for a two-year battery life. So you can get a lot of battery life if you're very, very clever about how you write your firmware for that particular radio on that particular device. TI has done some great work in the sensor uh, category for accelerometers and uh, light, you know, illumination, you know, gyroscope, name it, compass. You know, they got all kinds of crazy stuff that you can actually reach out and sense as an example. Um, my, so Bluetooth, so obviously I've spent a lot of time with Wi-Fi, that's no problem. Uh, I spent a ton of time with Bluetooth, and now I'm actually starting the 802.15.4 research. So you might have heard of this uh, technology before in its commercial term. It's called ZigBee. Maybe you have ZigBee or ZigWave. I'm not a big fan of either of those. Those were kind of older proprietary standards where ZigBee has kind of opened themselves up now. Um, but you can actually put some uh, true open standards, if you will, on top of this now. So 802.15.4, something called 6 Lopan, and then CoAP on top of that. And you can set up a mesh network, which means it's self-healing. 
it routes around problems. It doesn't have a central point of failure. So there's a, there's, the challenge with this particular space is not what, a lot of what I call developer kits that you can easily buy to start trying and hacking right away. Most people assume you actually will assemble your own PCB uh, right out of the gate. So there's, there's, different, there's definitely companies that are trying to make this easy, and some companies are like, hey, you're an electrical engineer. Just buy a bunch of chips and figure out how to wire them together. I personally am not that guy, right? I want, I want you to give me the board that works, <laughs> right, as an example. Um, OK, so we'll keep cruising along here. And I have some funny stuff, and I have a bunch of more demos I want to show you. Tell me if I'm talking too fast. And I have some things that might just run out of battery life before we get there. <laughs> um, oh, Lord, this thing doesn't quite fit, does it? So the, um, the reason I put this in here is because I do believe this world is like it was in the early 90s. So if, you're, if you guys are around in the IT sector in the early 90s, you might have remembered the stuff that existed prior to TCP IP taking over. You might have had Progeny, Progeny or Com, Progeny, right? CompuServe, AOL, <laughs> right, as in a home usage. But even in the enterprise, you had Banyan Vines, you had IPX, SPX, and NetWare, right? And you had TCP IP all competing. Uh, you had Token Ring networks and things of that nature. You guys remember all that stuff? Uh, I was actually a network administrator for my very first job out of college, so I actually had to use that stuff. And the world was very different then. Now we just, everything's on Wi-Fi. Every, and if it's not on Wi-Fi, it's on Ethernet. And it's just TCP IP, we get an IP address, we're ready to rock. So TCP IP has revolutionized that entire connectivity world in the enterprise, the enterprise data center, enterprise front office, if you will, as well as in the home. And we kind of need that to happen more in this space. There's still too many warring factions, if you will, warring standards that are trying to win this war. And we don't yet know who's really going to win. Like I mentioned, there's Z-Wave and Zigbee and things like that. But it'll, it'll happen. It'll all come to a couple of key standards that we'll all use. A couple of key ones that you can count on right now are obviously Wi-Fi, 802.11, Bluetooth. Bluetooth is pretty universal at this point. There's tons of uh, available hardware at very low cost, tons of developer kits available to you. Uh, and you can just get started with Bluetooth programming today pretty easily, uh, like most of my stuff here is Bluetooth. And the one that needs a little bit more uh, energy, if you will, is 802.15.4. So we're kind of in that moment. So well, we'll have to make this thing fit better. Um, but you can kind of see there's a numerous standards that are involved with this. Uh, and actually, let's do this. Oh, no, we'll, we'll just keep going. Um, there's, there's all these different specifications and standards that might, you might want to consider. There are some winners, as I mentioned, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, and I'm looking heavily at 802.15.4, specifically with 6 Lopan and Co-app. But there's some ones like Thread, which are interesting, right? So th Google, the Nest team has sponsored Thread as an example, which is a high-level protocol. Think of it more like REST, if you will, uh, at the top level of the stack, the OSI 7-layer model. Um, there's also another one called AllJoin and IOTivity, right, that are other options that are trying to compete in this space. So don't know if, who's going to win, and who knows when you actually will go to your local electronics store, and now you actually have to see, OK, am I buying a Zigbee product, a Z-Wave product, an IoTivity product, a Thread product? You know, all that might happen in our stores for the next few years, right? You'll have to decide, oh, I'm a, my house is a Thread house. My house is an IoTivity house, as an example. Um, what enterprises will do, though, is they'll simply ignore all that and they'll just go straight to the radio. <laughs> they'll just do 802.15.4, a 2.4 gigahertz channel, and be done with it just like Disney did, right? Disney just used the, the radio itself, and they set up a serial connection or just a broadcast connection across that. Um, another winner here, I would say, is MQTT. So for communicating from the thing to the, uh, the cloud, if you will, I use a lot of MQTT and some REST. That's all you really need, right? MQTT is a nice protocol. It's been around a long time. It's a very lightweight protocol. It's basic pub-sub messaging. I'll show you some examples of it here in my demos, but it works it really well. And it's been out there and it's proven, and there's numerous brokers that implement it. The uh, ActiveMQ broker implements it, but so does many, many others. It's an incredibly easy to use protocol. So I'll show you how easy it is in a, in a second. Uh, and it's easy to integrate with Java, Python, Node.js, Ruby. Everybody supports it, so it's that easy. Rest is, of course, an obvious winner. The one I believe will come up and win uh, is Coapp. So this one says Coapp here. Come on, mouse. There we go. Uh, the co-app right there. I think that also will be around. But you can see there's a lot of things to track. I'm going to keep marching along here. <laughs> I know you can't read this slide. And I, don't, I didn't print this slide for you guys to be able to read it here in the audience. But these are all the questions I can think of that you need answers to before you decide to go roll out 
some product in this space. So as you decide, oh, for my business, I work for Coca-Cola, and one of the things we really need to be able to do is track the trucks on the road and exactly the temperature of the truck, because if it gets too hot, then our product goes stale and whatever it might be, right? Um, one of the use cases we worked with uh, for a while was FedEx Custom Critical. If you, I don't know if you guys have heard of it. I have a video of the demo. It's a really awesome demo. But FedEx Custom Critical is pretty neat because if you, um, it's the people that have to, you know, FedEx is known for getting there. If you have to get it there overnight within 24 hours, you use FedEx. This is the team that basically gets it there in one hour because it's a heart or it's munitions or it's something insanely critical. And they will guarantee that it gets there within minutes. They have a, you know, you have to get it from point A to point B. And they literally monitor everything about the entire ecosystem to ensure that that product arrives on time. They're tracking all the air traffic control to know if flight delays are occurring, because it might be that it has to fly in one portion of its leg. They're monitoring all the traffic on the roads, the temperature in the atmosphere, the temperature on the truck, right? Because some of these things have to be refrigerated. And they will actually send another truck to intercept the truck that is starting to break down because this refrigeration unit is going offline. They'll send another truck to meet it in flight to move the product to get it on time to its destination. And they will send you a text message to let you know we're 30 minutes out, we're 10 minutes out, we're here now. It's an insane system. But you know, think of that level of customer service, and that's FedEx Custom Critical, and that's the system that runs on some of our software, specifically the Drools technology that does complex event processing. But you have to think those kind of use cases through. What, how timely does it have to be? How much battery life do I need? What kind of connectivity options do I have? Does it need to live underwater? Does it need to live in the heat or snow, right? And then how am I gonna connect that all to my enterprise infrastructure? How am I, once I got the data from the thing, what am I going to do to analyze it, dashboard it, commit workflows and business processes to it? All that has to be done, and that's why the magic band for Disney cost a billion dollars. All these things had to be considered, as an example. Um, so that's why I have that list of questions there. Let's kind of let you see this slide, but we have a lot of these things to show. Am I talking too fast? Am I on time? <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> Not everything fits. Um, so. You have two worlds, as I see it, in this world, right? You have what I call microcontrollers, which are things that really don't run an operating system from the way we think of it. Some people refer to it as an RTOS, real-time operating system, but it's not really an operating system the way we think of it. You can't SSH into this thing and, and talk to it, if you know what I mean. It basically is a piece of code that runs in a loop for all intents and purposes. As soon as you apply power to the device, it just starts running its code. And it primarily what you do is you interact with its pins. That's why you see all these little hairy things hanging off of it. You basically are looking for things to tickle its pins. And it's basically measuring voltage across those pins. That's all it's doing. So in other words, it's actually looking at, uh, you know, a sensor is simply saying, if the light is on, it's basically producing a voltage at a certain level, let's say at uh, one, one volt. If the light is off, zero volts. Right? That's it. Right? It's not like it's really that hard. Uh, and you'll write C++ or C code for these devices. So in this microcontroller world, this is where Arduino comes from. Uh, and actually, let me, you, the Uno is still going around the, the room there. But OK, now I don't have to compete with the fan anymore. I, excellent. I can talk less loudly. Um, but like, OK, so you've seen the Uno as an example. The Uno has no connectivity. That's one downside with it. It's just a microcontroller with no connectivity. This is also an Arduino. It's a lot smaller than the one going around the room. And it also has a big Bluetooth radio on it also. In this case, it has a temperature sensor, an accelerometer, and a light sensor that I've wired in there. And you can see it soldered it on. And it runs off a little watch battery. So again, Bluetooth Low Energy Technology can run off a watch battery. Here's a whole sensor package that I have to deploy. And that's still an Arduino. You program it with the Arduino IDE. That's actually pretty awesome. It's called Light Blue Bean. Um, here's another example. This is also an Arduino. Again, you program it the exact same way you do an Arduino. It's just that it's a really small Pro Mini from SparkFun. Uh, and if you look at all these pins that I've added to it, this is so I can connect it to the computer and then, of course, connect it to the physical world, right? So this is where all my little breadboard wires would go out and talk to my analog sensors or digital sensors, et cetera. So you can make these things, in, and that's still big. If you, if you really want a custom solution, the actual chip on it is right there, that chip. And that's a, uh, one of the bigger ones. <laughs> you can make it smaller than this if you need it to. You don't need all these pins for your use case. I only need four sensors. I don't need 15. You can eliminate all this, right? And actually, the manufacturers are happy to work with you on those sorts of use cases. That's what they do. But you know, it's a pretty cool you know, thing you can do in Arduino, right? These two are the one you see going around the room. Yes, sir? Do you interact with those pins through a TPI board? 
So, so in the case of a Raspberry Pi, they'd call that GPIO as you know, an example. So if you look at the Pi, yeah, this is a Raspberry Pi 1. This is the GPIO pins. They're hard to see here with this low light, but that's what's actually in there. So yeah, that, think of it as general purpose input-output GPIO. That's the easiest way for me to think about it as a software person. Again, I'm not an electrical engineer. I don't, you know, someone else here could probably give us a much better education on what that's specifically doing. But I know it measures voltage, and you can use the right code to say, hey, is, what's the voltage look like right now, right? Uh, and that will tell you something, right? If there's lots of light, little light. Lots of temperature, low temperature. That's all it's really kind of doing. Lots of movement, no movement, you know? Um, OK, so, that, uh, so those are an example of microcontrollers. On the other side of this chart, Okay, on the other side of this chart, I have Linux machines. So let's see if we can zoom in here. So these are Linux machines. I showed you the Intel Edison earlier, right? Uh, so that's what it looks like there. You can see you can buy that Intel Edison for $50. There's also the Raspberry Pi that everyone's heard of, the, the $35 device. Uh, it's actually relatively large because it has four USB component, uh, controllers, or four USB plugs, as well as the Ethernet plug on there. So that actually makes it kind of big. Um, but if you decide to design one of these on your own, there's something called a Raspberry Pi Compute Module, which eliminates all that, and it's just a CPU, basically. And it's just a Linux operating system. And then you wire that into your component any way you would want. Uh, you can also see there's the Arduino Yoon, so that's an Arduino plus a Linux machine rolled into one. It's more expensive, about $70. There's the BeagleBone Black here that's $45 from TI. This is actually all open source hardware. It's pretty cool. Uh, and then you can see there's also the Minnow board. Uh, there's a bunch of them happening right now. The one I backed on Kickstarter is Onion Omega. I also backed Chip. Uh, Chip is the latest one to kind of take over the universe because the, uh, most of these folks are nonprofit to no profit kind of companies. Raspberry Pi is a, do, a .org, it's a nonprofit, right? Arduino has been historically a nonprofit organization. Um, but the Chip guys got very clever. They realized that this world is booming that people want development kit hardware they can go experiment with. So they decided to actually put marketing dollars into the hardware dollars. So they're selling their whole Linux computer for $9. Now, the story on the street is they're manufacturing it for 20. But they got a lot of VC funding and it's easy to, you know, you know, basically say knock 11 bucks off that and sell it for nine. <laughs> now this is a story I've heard. I don't know if it's true. I don't work for them obviously. But this is how aggressive this, this market is right now. Right? People are really trying to get into this space. So I personally have used the uh, Edison. Uh, I like the Edison a lot. I have several here. I've got a ras multiple Raspberry Pis. I got the Onion on order. I've got the Spark. I'll show you the Spark in a minute. I've got the Light Blue Bean. I got the Pro Mini. I also got an Arduino. Uh, these are wearable versions of the same. You can look at Adafruit to see how you wire this into your clothing if that's what you want to do. So they have it. They come in every shape and size at this point. The one thing you'll find is most of them haven't thought through their connectivity options yet. And that's the downside for most of them. The Spark here actually has a Wi-Fi radio on board. Light Blue Bean has Bluetooth. TI Launchpad can offer both. Um, you know, so not everyone has thought through connectivity, especially in that Arduino world. So you have to you remember that. OK, it's great that I bought the product, but can I communicate anything? Uh, and most of those boards are still just kind of coming online. OK, this is just a joke. Can I give it to you quickly? The, um, <laughs> So this is actually from 1995. When I was actually looking through historical information, I found this from 1995. Rich Tennant was his name. If you guys remember Computer World way back in the day. I know Burke, you do, right? But this is great. So this guy, this is one engineer talking to another. These are friends of ours, right? Not ourselves, but friends of ours. Now, when someone rings my doorbell, the current goes to a scanner that digitizes the audio impulses and sends the image to a PC where it's converted to a PIC file. The image is then animated, compressed, and sent via high-speed modem to an automated phone service that sends an email message back to me to tell me someone was at my door 40 minutes ago. <laughs> and this is 1995 when this guy did this cartoon. He's a cartoonist, obviously. But we're kind of still here now, aren't we? We still haven't solved this problem perfectly, though there's a ton of things happening on Kickstarter right now trying to solve this specific problem. I actually backed one of them on Kickstarter also. I've actually spent too much money on Kickstarter lately. Um, <laughs> But let's see here, what else we have here? OK, I'll show you this, and then I will show you some demos. Where have you been, Burke? You're noticeably missing up to this point. <laughs> System down. So some skills that you'll, wanna, you'll have to start uh, creating for yourself. You'll have to start investing in. Just like if you had to learn a new programming environment, a new programming language. Right? I don't know if you, let's say you didn't know Java, but you just learned Java uh, last year. 
the first, you know, you had to start thinking through things like, well, how do I compile? How, what kind of files do I create? What does the directory structure look like? How, where do I compile? How do I build? How do I make a war ear or jar? You know, those were really basic skills you had to learn. And then you had to learn things like, oh, well, let me do file I.O. or database I.O. or network I.O., right? How do I do some form of data structure? Oh, there's this cool data structure already built into Java. And you had to learn those tools over time. The same kind of thing happens in this world, right? Very elementary skills like how to use a soldering iron, how to connect point A to point B and actually have a good physical connection between two things. Uh, like I showed you an example of something I'd soldered earlier. Um, and actually one of my demos is broken because the solder on it broke. And it wasn't even my solder, it came from China that way. And it literally broke on the trip down here. And I'll show you an example of it. But you've got to learn things like breadboarding and soldering, the difference between volts, amps, and watts, right? Uh, then you have your various hardware level communication mechanisms, serial as an example. These things all communicate with serial connections. That's it. Pulses over a line is the way to think of it. Then you get into resistors, capacitors, inductors, diodes, transistors. I have various resistors here uh, and capacitors here also. I actually have the shift registers and voltage dividers stuff, but I've just not had a chance to really spend much time on it. But these are skills you'll learn, a little bit more advanced skills. And then what's cool is at this very moment, you can actually buy a lot of the stuff just prepackaged for you, and I'll, that's what I'll demo for you in many cases. You can kind of just get the sensors already smart and ready to rock. All you got to do is connect to the sensor and deploy it. Uh, so a lot of companies like TI, Freescale, et cetera, are really just focusing on that. We'll just make it easy for you. Um, so let's kind of walk you through a bunch of demonstrations. And all right. All right, first of all, let's zoom back out there, and we'll go over here. Let's see what's still running over here. And I'm going to sit down if you guys don't mind, but I'm going to show you. Let's go. Let's. Uh, we'll just kind of be random here. All right. I'm going to show you this Intel Edison. All right. Remember, he's got the battery pack on him, uh, and that it is Intel as a set of one. I actually put a little mark on him so I can see he's number one. All right. And if he's still up, let me make sure I have my glasses here. So if he's still up, let's see here. All right. So I'm still connected to him. I'm SSH'd in turn from this laptop to this guy right here, and I'll make this a little bit smaller and move this over here, okay? So this guy right here, that's what we're talking about. That's who we're talking to right now. And I can actually, be, uh, in this case, it's just a Node.js application I created. So, okay, I've already, I've already done all that. So I'm going to basically um, pull her temp, come on, there. So if I look up here, it's going to basically make an MQTT connection from, uh, to this particular port. That's my server. That's my address here on this machine here. All right. Well, I'm still in. I don't want to do that. OK, never mind. <laughs> but that's my IP address for this particular machine. I'm number three. I'm running an active MQ uh, message broker here in one of these little windows. Where is it at? Uh, not that one. Too many windows open. There. All right, so there's my active MQ running right there. And so th when this guy makes a connection, it's basically going to grab the temperature data. Uh, which one is this one? It's going to actually grab the temperature data from my light blue bean. Yeah, my light blue bean. So over here, here's my light blue bean. See it right there? So this is my sensor. This is my gateway. And it's all going gonna to gather the data and push it back to this laptop, which is my data center for all intents and purposes. All right, so. I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to type in node. And if all goes well, watch this guy over here. See this green light came on? I, so I, that's actually part of the firmware I wrote to basically say, when I get connected, I'll turn my green light on. <laughs> that way you know it's connected. You can see now it's reading data through SSH here. Uh, that's going into my message broker. So let me go to my message broker here, do a refresh. You can see there's a ton of stuff happening here. Um, but this is the light blue bean here. See, uh, NQ count 18, let me refresh, 25. So those are where the messages are going. And if I go over here now, I'm actually doing broadcasting it directly out to the browser, and we can kind of see that data in real time. So, and again, this is all running on batteries. These are all the batteries, all right? If I put my hand over it, you can see the temperature rises, because I just made the temperature go up. So, you know, here, I'll just pass these around the room. We'll see how long it stays active. But, so basically, you know, Bluetooth, going to this guy, which is Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. He's grabbing the data, shooting it over Wi-Fi and MQTC to the message broker. It's kind of crazy if you think about it. And this is not much money here either. Here, so if you don't mind, just pass those around so people can see them. 
I'm not sure how far away from the router it'll stay to get, it'll still be active, but we can kind of just let that run. Okay, so you can see I'm SSH'd in there. Let me look at my other Edison. All right, where's my other Edison? Right over here. So this one I actually have wire, I have it physically plugged in because it needs power. I don't have a battery for it. And I'm going to connect it to uh, this TI sensor tag right here. Right, so this, this guy right here is a TI sensor tag, and this is just a rubber jacket for it. It is an MCU package, a sensor package from T Texas Instruments, uh, and it has a ton of sensors in it. It can read, uh, this one reads um, uh, basically acceleration and gyroscope compass kind of stuff, so physical movement. Uh, temperature, both its internal ambient temperature and external temperature. So you can actually make this like something you stick on someone's forehead, as an example. Um, and then the newer edition also reads light and I believe sound as well. So you can do a ton of sensor just experimentation, stick this out in your warehouse, out in your retail store or whatever with just one package. You don't have to do much with it. So let me go over there. Uh, so let me get into this guy, okay? Uh, yeah, so I'm already SSH'd in. Let me just run this component and I need to click the button to wake him up because he's on Bluetooth and by default he just goes to sleep because his battery, again, it's the same battery you see in the light blue bean, the exact same model. This thing will run for months, as far as I can tell. Okay, so it's grabbing temperature, and again, it's pushing it through my message broker and shooting it out to my browser in real time. So I'm literally streaming this data in real time through the entire infrastructure out to the browser in this case. This is actually using a library called MQTT.js, which allows you to put MQTT right into your browser. Not what, I wouldn't do this necessarily for a production system, but it's pretty cool to actually see the streaming uh, message data. Let me show you another one over here. All right, so I'm going to come up here to, this is my, my Raspberry Pi, and I have a mess here, I apologize for that. So this is my Raspberry Pi, and you can see there's a ton of little wires here. These are the GP, GPIO pins specifically that I've wired into, and I actually have a bunch of little sensors that I decide to kind of hand build. Forget the TI sensor tag, I want to see each individual sensor and play with it individually. And the actual temperature sensor is this little black thing right here, this little tiny thing. There's also an LED. There's also a light, uh, what's called a photoresistor for light measurement, as an example. And I've wired it all in to my uh, GPIO pins, including this motion sensor here. And actually, this represents a uh, kit that we actually gave away at Summit, and we had about 119 people build their own sensor, distributed sensor network, and connect it in just as you see me doing here, right? Connecting into the message broker. And then once it's in your message broker, it's off into your enterprise LAN, right? Use camel, use whatever, and do whatever you will with it. Um, but let me see here. So this is my, this is my, yeah, let's use this guy right here. All right, uh, so dun, dun. let's see if I do that correctly. And get connected. And there's the temperature flowing in. If I put my finger over it, you watch it get a little bit warmer. So it's 27, 28, 29, can I get 30, 30? Just by heating it up with my finger. And again, it's going through the same process and pushing it out to the browser. Uh, wait, there's more. <laughs> okay, now in this case, this is actually the same Raspberry Pi. I've SSH'd into it again, a different session now, and now I have yet another TI sensor tag sitting right here. So it's gonna use this Bluetooth dongle and its Wi-Fi dongle to basically read the Bluetooth data stream out of here and over Wi-Fi connect it back through ActiveMQ. So just like the little package I sent around earlier, but just with the Raspberry Pi, and so let me get that one going. Again, I gotta click the button to wake it up. It goes to sleep by default. There we go. So this little guy right here, and it's gonna collect this, the, uh, again, it's a wireless connection, right? It's making the Bluetooth connection to this guy. And if you watch right here, see it says 21, 22. If I put my hand over it, we can get that temperature to shoot up there. Again, because it's looking at the external temperature based on the object. You know, I can measure my, how hot is my head right now? Something like that. How hot is my laptop? Let's see if the laptop's pretty hot. Um, you know, so you can get that temperature data, and again, I'm just streaming it back out right into my, you know, right out here into my browser, as another example. So that's just a simple example of temperature data, but this thing actually, again, has sound, light, illumination. It's called a luxometer. Um, uh, let's see here, what else do I have? Let me just control C. Uh, so in this case, I'm mostly doing temperature and humidity, but if I come over here, TI sensor tag, nah, dim, bump, bump, whoop. All right, uh, I have numerous examples here. Luxometer, gyroscope, barometer, what's the pressure and you know, things like that, accelerometer. There's also buttons physically on this. You can actually test the click of the button. I've seen someone else actually make wire this in to be their presenter tool. It actually flipped the slides for them. 
by the click of these buttons. Again, all over Bluetooth and simple programming. Um, so magnetometer as well, that's, your, you know, that's the proximity to a particular magnetic source. It might be particularly useful for what you're trying to do, you know, depending on what you're trying to sense. So you can sense a lot of things. Physical movement in the room with you or the physical movement of this object, the temperature, the humidity, the barometer, the air pressure, right? What is it you would like to know? What is it you've always wondered that happens? Why is it that server always dies at midnight every night? Because the janitor comes by and kicks the button, <laughs> right? Maybe that's what you want to know. Um, what else do we have here? I've got a lot of other crazy examples. Oh, let's show you this. OK, my focus is really getting out of whack here. All right, I'm going to show you this. I didn't bring all my stuff with me because it's really hard to carry through the security at you know, the airport. Can you imagine that? Um, but here's my Raspberry Pi, and actually these wires are all loose here because this actually goes to a relay primarily. And so with a relay, so this is basically, uh, what is Raspberry Pi? 3.3 volt logic? I forget, Rich. I get them all confused. Edison's 1.8, Arduino's 5, this is 3.3 volt logic. So with 3.3 volt, you can't do too much with that. That's not much electricity, right? <laughs> There's not a lot of current there. So if you want to drive something kind of bigger, you pump it through a relay, and a relay is nothing more than an electronic switch. So you give it a, just enough electricity to flip the switch that has a regular wall-mounted wire going through it to turn on the lights in this room or the air conditioning unit or send the space shuttle up to the atmosphere if that's what you want to do. So the relay is a very special electronic circuit that you can buy for, again, a few dollars. And so I use this to turn lamps on and off. I can use this to run a candy machine as an example or even just turn on this little LED if that's what I want to do as an example. Uh, but I don't have that hooked up right now. What I do have hooked up is this little guy. All right, so this is a little servo right here. So it's a little servo with just this little arm on it. Um, and what I'm going to do, yeah. So I'm going to, I'm actually on, so I've SSH into this Raspberry Pi over here. I'm going to run this little subscribe. Uh, so this is, again, subscribing for, to MQTT messages. And, it, uh, whoop, don't fall off over there. <laughs> that guy right there. Um, and let me find my other little screen. And I can send it messages. So let's, let's send it, oh, let's say, I can just send messages to it. Do you see it move left? Right, that's it's what it thinks is left. That's what I programmed it for, though, right? You know, come back to center. Again, a trivial example. But I can send these messages from anywhere on the internet to make that little thing move. Turn the lights on and off. You could really haunt somebody really well with this. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Think about the pranks you could orchestrate with all this kind of technology. But it's that hard once you learn how to do the hardware side of it. The software side of it, where we come from, the hardware people, the hardware people think, oh my god, that cloud stuff, that app server, web, oh my god, that's impossible. I don't know how to do any of that. For us, it's easy. And if you get pretty good at this, all it is is a rest call. I could do curl commands to make the arm move, as an example. I could send MQTT messages off the command line. Th this is literally just pushing it through the, a message through the message broker. And that guy's subscribing to the message broker, uh, again, over the Wi-Fi chip that I put in it, Wi-Fi dongle. And now it's making those movements happen. I'll show you what actually broke in my trip here. Um, all right, so in this, this right here is a battery pack. And you notice there's only one wire sticking out of it because the other one broke off. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to scotch tape it together. Isn't that horrible? Um, but if we do this right, I can make this still work. So let's see if this will work, if it's turned on. OK. And let me go back over here. We'll just kind of go directly to the Raspberry Pi in this case. OK. And I'm going to hold this properly. Let's see here. This is where you really know your demo hacking, right? Um, let's move this over so you can see it. So this actually controls the big gripper hand there. I got that real cheap. <laughs> so let's do this. Yeah, no. If, all right, so we're going to basically, if I get the, the reason I have to use this battery pack is this thing actually has a big enough servo in it that the Raspberry Pi cannot drive it, right? It's, again, a 3-volt thing. This thing needs 5 volts. There's not enough power in it. But you can actually take four uh, AA batteries, which are 1.5 volts each. So I got 6 volts here. That's more than enough to drive it. And basically, um, I've wired it through the breadboard, so it's pulling, it's picking its electricity, right, from this battery pack. It's picking its signal up from the Raspberry Pi. In other words, it's the Raspberry Pi is telling it what to do, but the power is coming from another source. So if I do this right, if I got to hold this down, all right, and 
There it opens up. And if I can go close. So this is kind of silly, I know, but let's see here. I'm going to get it connected and close it up. All right, and it's, you know, but my wire is broken. If I had a soldering iron, which didn't allow you through security with, it looks like a weapon, I could fix that pretty easily because it's just a solder that's broken. All right, it's just that solder right there that broke off. Um, so there's, you know, my, again, my point with this presentation is kind of show you guys the, what is possible. You can see there's just a ton of stuff you can do to either use sensors to gather data. And if that's all you ever do, that's still a huge win. I've now talked to several startups. That's, that's all they're doing. They basically are saying, oh, my God, I can go to my manufacturing facility, my warehouse facilities, my electrical smart grid for a power company. I can go to any of my retail outlets. And I, just adding sensors is a massive win because now I can know more about the world in which my, my systems have to operate. And then when you get to actuating, actuators like this robot hand, you know, maybe that's just the bonus on top. You know, what can you do? What can you do to react to the physical world and then do something to the physical world? Turn the knob if that's what you need to do. Uh, I want to show you one other example too, though. <laughs> I got a lot of this stuff. Uh, here's another example that I put together. And let me go ahead and plug it in. It's not powered up. And actually, I forgot about this guy. Let's go ahead and pass him around the room too. This is another example of a microcontroller. So this is not a Linux machine. This is a microcontroller. And you can see it there. I'm going to hit the power button, and he's coming to life now. So as soon as he gets power, he boots up and starts running his code. And all this is is an accelerometer and an LCD. The accelerometer is this red thing right here, and the LCD is pretty obvious, I hope. And it just has a bunch of C++ code that basically says as the accelerometer changes its uh, data, its senses, right, what it senses, just move that little circle on the screen. And I put it on, again, another iPhone battery so you guys can, it's fully portable. So here's your own, you know, this is your next uh, Game Boy, for example. All right. Um, there's one problem with the MCU world, though, right, the microcontroller world. That, that device has no connectivity by default. So that's something you have to wire in your own radio if you want a Wi-Fi. And you can. On that breadboard, I could have added a radio also as an example. Um, just to show you that, let me also show you this craziness here that I have. All right, let me plug him in. It's going to get its power from the computer, but that's not required. I'm just plugging into the computer to get it going. So let's see if it actually connects. It's going to send green, 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 looking for the router. And then it's called breathing cyan. C-N. How do you pronounce that? C-Y-A-N. Cyan? C-N? <laughs> so that, it looks like it connected. Good, good. Um, but this one, is, this is a microcontroller. The Wi-Fi radio is here on top. You, again, you program it in C code. Um, this is actually a spark core from the fo particle folks. And you can see my little graphs there still running, <laughs> running along. Um, but one thing that's cool about it is you can program this C code in the browser, and it does an over-the-air update to it. So if you actually have physically deployed these things around the globe, as long as they still have a connection, you can basically flash it from afar. That's actually pretty awesome if you think about it. So you can make this update to the code. Um, uh, there, the other one that I just passed around that you saw earlier, that's this. it's called the embed. It's actually an NXP1768. It's actually the embed device. So again, uh, looking at C code for that accelerometer and LCD. Uh, also a web-based user interface for doing your code editing. So a lot of that's occurring in this world too. Web-based uh, code editors is an example. In this case though, what I really want to show you, where's my mouse again? Oh, come on. Yeah. Uh-oh, did you make it go away? Did you break it already? I did. Wow. All you got to do is uh, uh, pull the battery out, though, and replug it in. It'll start from the very beginning of the cycle. <laughs> I've not had anyone break that before. You got special skills. This is why we call you Hacker. That's her name, by the way. <laughs> okay. Um, but this guy right here has an accelerometer on board. It has a temp humidity sensor, a light sensor. And then these are pretty cool. It has pressure sensors, and this means physical pressure. So if you think about, you know, in the warehouse or manufacturing environment, you need to know that the person's standing in the right location before the machine operates. Otherwise, the machine might cut them in half. You guys have probably, I don't know if you've ever done a tour of a, of a factory or warehouse. I've, I've seen these before. You know, the person needs to be putting their hand where the handprint is and their feet where the footprint is, or the thing will eat them. And so these are, very, these are very serious safety measures. So that's why I use these sensors, too, to kind of reflect that. I have to have pressure here. 
Otherwise, this system doesn't operate, let's say. And I can measure the pressure, measure the pressure. And in this case, this is clever. You can actually measure, is it left, right, or center? You can actually measure the pressure along the spectrum. And these are all relatively inexpensive sensors you can get from SparkFun. So I recommend, um, well, actually, let's do that real quick. Let's go to the browser. Uh, let's see if I am online. And see if I'm still connected. All right, cool. SparkFun is a place you can go along with Adafruit to figure all this out. But just look at the sensor tab here at SparkFun. And just imagine all the things you might want to learn about in the physical world. The LiDAR there is pretty awesome. right? So you want an approximation of distance. So with the distance measurement, this is how you'll know if your bin is empty and needs to be replenished. There's, I have an opening in the warehouse. Somebody go put something in it. I have a bin of coal that's empty or nearly empty. So the LiDAR is primarily used in robotics case, like so I don't bump into corners. If you think of the Roomba, right? It's using a LiDAR type technology. But you know, look at all these things. So there's multiple dist distance sensors. Uh, FLIR is a long distance wireless protocol. No, wait. I always get FLIR mixed up. So FLIR is not that. There's another one. So it's a similar name, this long distance um, wireless, pro uh, wireless protocol. Uh, an accelerometer at nine degrees of freedom. Um, you can just kind of go crazy here. And then they all have tutorials for how to wire them up and get going. And you can just try all sorts of craziness, uh, including things like I have a pulse sensor, right? I have an EKG-like sensor. Um, I was actually going to build my own wearable to see if I'm unhealthy or not. I didn't get to it yet. Um, and if you, if you think about it, you can hook it up with that battery-operated uh, Edison, at, which is like a wristwatch. So I can basically have a Linux-powered wearable that I'm wearing on my body all the time. I uh, just haven't got that far with it yet. But just to show you this guy, one thing to show you here. So it should be booted up. It looks like he's connected. We'll just let it sit right there. <laughs> Very inelegant, I know. This is the hard part about hardware. It's messy. The wires and batteries and stuff are all over the place. Um, but I want to show you. All right, let's see if it'll connect for me. OK, fantastic. So you see, this is a serial monitor. I'm connected now to the device and its serial stream output. This is how you debug it. You're thinking, oh my god, I think I'll kill myself now. But this is the world of microcontrollers, right? You can get high-end, expensive debugging software from the various parties that produce the chips, right? There's two, three, four, five thousand dollar kits or whatnot. But for free, you get the serial monitor. Uh, and actually, I had to pay five bucks, I think, for this particular one. Uh, but you can use the Arduino serial monitor built into the IDE. But this is, if you notice, it's just a loop that's running here. Um, let me see. I think I have the code. Where's my code at? Do I have the code? Oh, it's in my Atom Editor. I'm using the Atom Editor more. Uh, but yeah, here's the code for that. OK. Here's the serial monitor. And I've got find my flashlight. If you hit it with too much light, bright light. <laughs> if you, um, so who, OK, bright light. Who knows the 80s reference for that? Exactly. I want, to, I want this to be a gremlin thing. Come on, too much bright light. Um, don't get it wet, right? I was going to add a wet, you know, moisture sensor. But you can see if I cover it up too, low light, that's all it is. So look how hard that logic is. That's my firmware for that sensor. That's all I wanted to know. I could have made it more creative, but I was just trying to figure out how to make it work. That's all. So a very simple technology, very easy to program. I really like the Spark technology. It's actually now known as Particle, Particle I.O. is their new name. I keep calling it Spark, but they renamed themselves. Yes, sir, you have a question in the back? Uh, I, I, do, I do have a question. And, and that's this. But my question is about uh, uh, exactly how advanced, the, the, how advanced the miniaturization is. Uh, for example, uh, supposing uh, I wanted to install a functionality inside, inside a football see if the pressure is correct. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you think about it? So uh, I think that's, that's actually a great example. So the, the question is basically, how far is miniaturization gone? And there's actually already basketballs on the market that will help train an NBA player specifically how to shoot better. And it literally is tracked. They track the basketball's acceleration all throughout the court as they pass it, movement, shoot it. Plus, they have cameras and other sensors around the court so they can see if they're getting the right arc on their passes or their shots and things like that. That's already something that's already in place. So the football one's actually very easy. I don't know. I just it's just NFL has to allow for that or not. I've got an interesting thought about that. Um, teams are using drones uh, when 
when the, when the linemen practice their technique, they're, they're, they're usually grown. And, and, uh, and guess what team's in trouble with the FAA? <laughs> Yeah, so the, the drone concept, of course, has FAA rules that you have to apply by. Is there anyone here that's a drone person? Oh, no, no, okay, we have a couple in Raleigh. Uh, but, you know, I, that's still kind of more for fun right now, but I, I, I actually thought it was only for fun, and maybe only for consumer purposes. Like at, so at 4th of July, uh, you know, you saw drones flying at the fireworks. If you went to any fireworks, you probably saw a drone running through the fireworks. I certainly did this past year. Uh, if you were paying attention, one of those lights was not a firework, it was a drone. Um, which is technically illegal in most places now. But the great use case for drones, I actually met with a very large power company, very, very large power company. And they're like, oh yeah, we have a whole team exploring drones. It's like, why in the world would you be exploring drones to deal with your smart grid, smart home, all that stuff? You're a power company. They're like, we have a whole lot of high tension power lines that run for many, 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 many miles all throughout this area, like the entire eastern seaboard, I think. Um, and every now and then we have to rent helicopters to figure out what the quality of those lines are. Is limbs laying on top of them? A big storm came by, did they get knocked down? Are they just simply needing maintenance? If we have a fleet of drones to go out and do the inspections with machine vision technology, we'll know if they need maintenance and we don't have to send a man and a helicopter out any longer. It's like, wow, enterprise class drone use case, but that is certainly one. Um, they're, lo they're looking at it, you know? It's, it's a lot cheaper than a helicopter. A lot cheaper than a helicopter. The average drone these days can be had for, if you build your own, for a few hundred bucks. Now, oh, they can look for potholes. <laughs> 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 yes. I said a guy who uh, he, he films, he flies drones, he films all kinds of things with these drones. The major constraint is that they only fly for about 12 minutes. Right. So 10 to 20 minutes. The next thing they're going to try and do is try and make them be able to fly for longer. Exactly. And so the great, so there's, so there's two big um, capacity problems in this whole space that the world has yet to figure out. And the person or people or team who do are gonna be billionaires, right? One of them is the battery. The concept of NICAD and lithium ion and all that, we kind of played it out. The little, uh, this little uh, Linux box that's been running around the room here, um, he's still on actually. So I've actually run him on that little battery for three, so this battery, just put it here, for three solid hours pulling data nonstop from the Bluetooth radio and Wi-Fi radio simultaneously. That ain't too bad for this little tiny battery. You can get them a lot bigger than this, as an example. Um, so your drone, though, is pumping four DC motors, right? It's a quadcopter at high RPMs. It's also doing a lot of calculations to basically keep it stable. And so you're looking at 10 to 20 minutes on a drone battery. So that's just where we are right now for that. The other big limiting factor in our world is wireless communications that are also cheap on the battery. And so that's where 802.15.4 might be the game changer in that space. Bluetooth has certainly already been a game changer. That's how we're getting all our wearables right now. Again, low energy, wireless technology, but it's relatively short distance. Uh, while 802.15.4 could really go you know, across the factory, as an example, while you wouldn't necessarily do that with a Bluetooth signal. Yes, sir? I have a question. Is there a trend going in terms of being more compute power on the thing? Some more compute power? Oh my God, it's insane right now. So everybody is trying to one-up each other. Every vendor, every ARM vendor and Intel vendor, so I have Intel product and ARM product up here, they're, this is, they're going guns blazing to win this market. Uh, so this is bigger than the smartphone market by a couple orders of magnitude is how they're looking at it. Right. 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 The implications of that, do you have any ideas, all this, what are the implications of putting more people on the thing? Do you mean yourself as well as the mesh? The, so in the case, so you can get a, you, there's some rules of physics and there's some just rules of, uh, you know, there's some physics issues if associated with this world and there's just some issues of cost. So you can actually get a 64-bit chip, right, that'll run on something, you know, like this if you wanted to, which will basically is a, a data center class server machine, you know, that can run, let's say, 10,000 users on a website, right? You can, you can do that sort of thing, but it's an expensive chip and it takes a lot of power. So the, this world is really all about how do we lower the power consumption and lower the actual price per unit to the point where it's in the, in the pennies to dollar, single dollar range. That's what everybody's trying to do so that you can then deploy, dis, uh, deploy a million of them, right? That's one of the goals is I want to put a million Fitbits in the, in the market and I want to spend very little for that. I think that's kind of for me. I've been getting the notion if you're analytics in the cloud or some sort of 
intermediary interstellar computer. How do you distribute it at the price level? What's the consequences? Oh, you're certainly seeing that now. So what, what's happening in the market um, that I see, based on my ability to follow it, is, you know, I'll just go back to this slide here. Um, all right, so these are just all different types of developer kits that are happening in the market. There's, it's absolutely exploding. You know, I built this slide a few months ago. It's already outdated, but, you know, many, some of these players aren't really hardly players anymore. Basically, every week, someone's bringing out new hardware that one-ups the previous generation a week earlier. It is really kind of crazy right now. So this is just like in the early days of you know, PCs, right? Dell computers versus gateway computers. Every month when you got the next computer magazine or PC world, you know, someone had one up the megahertz on the CPU or just a little bit more memory or a little bit more disk space every month. Now we're in week by week mode for this world. It's literally week by week. Somebody's trying to change the game. So you will at some point have to decide how to bake your product and get it out to the world at large. Whether if you work for, you know, whatever, you, whatever solution you try to create, you will have to make a decision. You'll have to bake it into real physical hardware and you'll have to ship it. In which case you're married to that for a while. And one of the things I would encourage people to think about as they enter this space for the first time is most people who do hardware think in terms of decades. We as software people don't think like that, right? We don't, you know, we don't think of the software running for decades. Heck, the whole computing industry has only been around for three or four decades from the world that we know of it, right? So, but the hardware people really think like that. And they actually report to a different part of the organization. It's called OT, not IT, operations technology versus information technology. And OT people think in terms of power grid, 50-year investment, return on investment. I'm building a dam. I would need 80-year return on investment. That's often where their heads are at. And I believe this world is going, it's going to be disrupted. It's going to change. We're not building dams. We're simply building gadgets that look like this little thing here, right? It doesn't have to last 80 years. As a matter of fact, if I get two years out of it and then it goes away, I've got all the value I need out of that because it only cost me 25 bucks. And if I get a year out of it, I've won. I've now discovered something I didn't know before about my environment. I've now done all my experimentation through my proof of concepts. And now I can better serve my customers, better ship product on time, better know that better, you know, better conserve energy within this factory plant or hospital or mall or whatever it is that you're monitoring. You can make a change pretty easily in that time frame, and then get new hardware the next next year. Yes, sir. I am not, but it, I believe them to work a certain way, and I might be wrong in my uh, assumption, but like if I look here at this basic code that's running on that, um, that Spark as an example, you have the ability to put as much code there as you want within the physical limitations of the device. So one thing I didn't mention about the microcontrollers versus the mini Linux machines, microcontrollers typically have K of RAM, K of flash, and uh, it's a 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit processor. So you can only throw so much code at it before you overwhelm it. You can show the web server in your hand. Right. That's what I'm about. So that's a mini Linux machine. That's it. So now you're getting into... So what you're seeing, you're, just like in the old Dell, Dell versus Gateway computers back in the early 90s, you're literally seeing, oh, I've got half a gig of RAM this week. I've got some, you know, some megs of RAM. I've got a gig of RAM. I now give you four gig of flash. No, I give you five gig of flash. It is insane what's happening right now. Um, and it's so, you have to decide the balance of how much, how much power do you throw at the device versus how much battery it consumes and how much connectivity do you want to the device. So you can literally push as much code out there as you want. In most of my examples here, and even in that example I showed where everybody moved around the conference center, we actually wanted all the data to come back to the main central hub, in this case my message broker, just to show that we could handle the load, right? That's, we just wanted to see all the data. Because there might actually be something in that stream of data that you otherwise won't think about that actually is kind of important, but you don't know until you get it into the system and do the analytics on it. But there is a huge movement to push analytics and data capture further out to the edge so that you don't have as much data coming back to the main data center. Yes, yes sir. Security. Uh-huh. That's, that, that's the big question. 
but yeah, that is the uh, elephant in the room, right? Specifically security. And so security is kind of a wide open thing at this moment because we're still trying to figure out what all the security standards should be and ought to be for this world. But if it is a Linux machine and you're communicating to it through TCP IP, you have, again, not every device supports it, but most do. You have SSL, HTTPS, the same security that you have for the, inter the internet itself. So if you believe that that's good enough to post your credit card transactions to Amazon and for your .com to process billions of dollars of transactions a year, you have the same level of security for some of these devices. Not all of them, some of them. In other cases, like the MCU example, like you know, this, actually, this processor here is a 32-bit processor. It actually has built-in encryption and authentication technology built right into their firmware. So one of the things they give you in their development kit is firmware with encryption and, and, uh, and, and authentication built right in. Right? So you can, I'm sure you could crack it if you work hard enough. Um, not to mention, you've got to also keep in mind from a security standpoint that this is deployed into the physical world. It is outside your data center. Yeah. Therefore, someone can literally hack it, like take their screwdriver, pop it open, and then try to figure out how to make these pins do their thing. You can actually. Well, also, also, since you, you know, flash deploy code for these things. Right. You can secure them to the point where only you can flash them. Uh, you know what I mean? Only you with the right passwords and uh, certs can do, the pa can do the flashing. But what is happening in this space, specifically in the microcontroller space, uh, like this light blue bean, you can see it's actually still going here. Um, he's still on. So these guys are still connected, doing their work. <laughs> uh, this guy right here, uh, actually what you would do, uh, there's not a lot of security built in other than what Bluetooth offers, which Bluetooth does offer an authentication and basic encryption right out of the Bluetooth radio, Bluetooth spec. But in the case of that, what's on the board itself, you would actually buy another chip that gives you the encryption and authentication capabilities. It's a specialized chip for that. So the silicon vendors are literally making chips for those user use cases. So is it perfect? No. But we've already deployed a million Fitbits or something. It seems to be OK for a Fitbit. So you'd, again, you'd have to decide how important your use case is versus what they're doing, as an example. If you're controlling someone's pacemaker, you better be a lot more concerned about it. Right? If you're simply monitoring their heart condition, you can be less concerned about it. One's reading, one's writing. That's how I look at it. <laughs> um, making changes from that perspective. Uh, this is another example. This is actually uh, a Bluetooth chip here. That's it right there on the back. And this is where the battery goes. I show you this one because uh, like, it's, it's very similar to this one, right? The difference is this is about if you run this in iBeacon mode, which is what we're doing uh, for the demo that we showed you, it only runs for about five days on that little battery. This one has a more aggressive sleep cycle. Uh, you can also lower the transmission power much easier on it. It has a really great user interface. Uh, it's an Estimote beacon. This is its normal packaging. I cut it out so I can see it. Um, the Estimote beacon, as an example, uh, will run up to two to three years pretty easily. And this Texas Instrument one, uh, this again is approximately you know, 12 months or so, same idea. But this has a ton of sensors in it. This one hardly has any sensors in it. And uh, Texas Instruments just made an announcement that they're going to 10 years on a battery with the Bluetooth technology and the low power aggressive sleep cycles. So basically aggressive sleep cycles means if I don't need to know anything right now, put myself to sleep and only wake up if something in the world has changed or only wake up if someone touches my radio. That's actually how I programmed the firmware for this one. So this one only wakes up if someone connects to its radio like this guy did, right? And then that's when it wakes up. Otherwise, it's gotten a pretty aggressive sleep cycle. And actually, let's see if this works. So see that little green light is on? Where did uh, where'd this one go? This is my first Edison. Uh-oh, I did get an error there. But uh, that one's still reading. OK. <laughs> and it's not going to disconnect correctly, because I did get that error. But you can see my green light's still on. Normally, if I get it disconnect cleanly, you see the green light go off, because it goes back into sleep mode. OK. So a lot of stuff that we showed you there. In a very short period of time, um, hopefully that answers some questions or at least gets you guys inspired to go look at this space. The, what did I have here? There's, so there's a list of demos that I have that I've already recorded out there on my YouTube channel. You'll see different examples of all these things you saw here tonight, some different things as well. You'll see even that map, um, that map that I showed you at the very beginning of the session where we actually track people using the Bluetooth signatures. So hopefully you can see there's a lot of cool stuff you could do in this space. It may not be for you. But I've found that every time I've given this presentation to people, they immediately go home and go, there's like four cool things I could go do right now. 
I didn't realize you could buy this stuff so inexpensively. You could get all the tutorials at SparkFun or Adafruit. You can Google for anything, anything in the Arduino world or Raspberry Pi world. Nine people have already done before you. Google for your question. You'll find the answer. They'll have a recipe specifically at some website someplace that tells you exactly what you should do. If they're really good at writing tutorials, to tell you what to order. And really, the biggest holdup in this whole space, other than you know, there's some technology that's yet to be invented, is you have to wait for the UPS, the FedEx person, to deliver it to you over the course of the next few days. And one other thing, uh, I mean, that sounds kind of crazy, but if in software world, you used to download and try right now. In this case, we've got to wait three days for the product to ship to our house. And um, some of this stuff can be had very inexpensively, but you've got to buy it direct from China, and that could take a month to get to your house. So you've got to really know you're committed to that, you know, that product, because I'm going to wait 30 days before I can run my experiments. Um, the, uh, the other thing I would encourage you to think about is if you're a software person, I know I went into this initially with some trepidation of, oh, I'm going to shock myself. I'm going to burn. I'm just, th this stuff could blow up. I've only killed one thing, and that's because I purposely wired it backwards to see what it would do, and it did burn. It, and when I say burned, it simply could sit done, right? That was it. You released the magic white smoke. Right? Yeah, the white smoke. But there's actually, there was no white smoke. It just, it just died. Yes, sir? Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> but it's easy to do. And, but as long as you're using these batteries right here are so low power, Connecting power to ground just gives you a little shock, like if you take a nine volt and stick it on your tongue. <laughs> you've done, you've tested a nine volt battery with your tongue before, haven't you? Come on, at least I'm from Alabama. I will admit to it. <laughs> yeah, that was still good. Put it, in the, stick it back up in the ceiling. Just stick your pocket knife to it. Yeah, that gets a little more exciting that way. Um, so I think that is about all I want to show you. I didn't have a lot of slides, but I had a lot of demos. Hopefully that was uh, interesting to you guys. If you have other questions, I'm available for a while after. Or you want a few more questions now? What do you got, Summers? OK. Um, this is a very, very, very specific question. Um, which one of the embedded Linux devices had the fastest I squared C bus? Fastest I squared C bus. I've not measured those in particular. Um, so I know for so a fact the Raspberry Pi B, I want to say, has a 400 kilohertz one. Well, it, it might also be based on the generation of Raspberry Pi. This is Raspberry Pi 2 versus Raspberry Pi 1. You will see a vast difference in performance on that guy. Now, in the case of my Intel Edison, as an example, so this is, these guys are using Raspbians. You can also get uh, builds of Fedora, things like that on them. This guy's using Yocto, which is a build-your-own Linux. All right? So you can, you can make your own Linux. That's actually very common in this space. So you can decide exactly what you want, what packages you want. Um, I don't, uh, this one actually is notable for, it's got a very cool, you can't see the connector in there, but it has a very cool connector that you can then break out to all the different pins that you want. Yeah. Um, but I've not actually measured I2C, I2C on it. You had a question over here? Yeah, so for those of us who still want to stay in software world, what are the things to pay attention to on the software side? So on the software side, you got to think through the connectivity options you wish to offer to the world at large. Uh, if, if in fact you only have to offer one thing, it's REST. If you can offer a second thing, it's MQTT. Um, and if there's a third thing, well, it's probably the second thing, actually, WebSockets. So a lot of the stuff is happening, they just do REST. I'm doing a lot of MQTT here because I want to experiment with that, but REST is certainly very easy. Um, and then you can, and WebSockets is also seems to be getting a little traction. But there's a bunch of other protocols, but if you just want to open yourself up to some protocols, REST is pretty easy, I would hope, and you probably already have the security and API management tools you need for that. And then you need to think through what to do with analytics for all this data that you're now capturing. And you can think of it like all the footprints. I think of the footprints on the website, right? All that log traffic that you have in your lo uh, web logs, and how do you basically rip through all of that to determine how long people are sitting on pages and what they're specifically looking at, and how to then offer them the product that they want the next time they come to the site. If you think through all those kind of analytics, you have the same problem here. Um, so that's, analytics is where it's at. Big data is where it's at. One of those hype things. Would you say also co-op would be also over there as well? I, I don't know about co-op yet. Co-op is one of those that hasn't it's what I call, it's rising. it's close. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the thing was, is it, it, it's, the, with the MQTT, it was kind of like, it's been out there a while. It's real well entrenched, well right. understood. Um, but it's kind of like, it's all, it, it doesn't really fit into what people already understand, into that the protocol where, Co-op kind of does fit into the stuff that we're used to seeing, I guess, as a protocol. So that's where I think it's got its edge. 
So like you said, HBTT seems to be the primary co-op, I think, is the up-and-comer. We'll have, to have enough to make it over the hump. Make it over the hump. Yeah. But it's, it's got a lot of attention. Yes, sir. Summer's talked to me about that square C. Uh, yeah, it is I squared C, not I2C. <laughs> uh, on the back end, are you seeing uh, high bandwidth technologies and all this information gets coalesced, say like uh, InfiniBand or RepidIO? That's a very good question, very good point. Um, I don't sit, I don't spend much time in the data center figuring out how Ops actually runs those things, especially since everything is now going to, you know, it's a cloud thing. From a developer standpoint, it's elastically scalable, you don't care. Uh, the times I have talked to data center people, they are going to InfiniBand that I've seen. Most, most people have some sort of crazy backbone built into each rack um, that is insanely fast. <laughs> so InfiniBand was one of those, but there's others, I believe, on the market now that are... Right. I was actually looking at some of those chips. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's like 20 gigabits a second. Right, right. Well, and, and what's weird is we're looking at FPGA data centers. Right? I mean, that's occurring now. People are looking at that. People like Facebook and others that have to deal, or uh, Bitcoin mining clouds, right? Build the chip for the use case. For, don't make a general purpose uh, CPU. Build a chip for the use case, specifically in this case, Bitcoin mining or some other operation. And there's a whole other team of people I ran into just a couple weeks ago that blew my mind. They're using NVIDIA GPUs for everything. Everything, the GPU. They don't care about any other aspect of the computer other than the GPU because it's uh, genome stuff, right? They're doing DNA sequencing and all that. So they wrote their code specifically for the GPU, and that's how they deal. That's how they get the scale they need out of the system. Um, so there's some interesting stuff happening, even in what I'd call the traditional data center, starting to morph in a big way. Last night I gave a presentation to Trijug before I flew down here on Docker. If you've not checked out Docker, you really ought to. It's pretty awesome technology from a Linux container standpoint. And then Kubernetes on top of that, which is the, you basically can bring Google to your data center. So Google has open sourced what makes Google Google. It's called Kubernetes. And it's specifically for running, I think they just announced yesterday, they launched 2 billion containers a week using this technology. And so that's where you can really change how your data center behaves in a very huge way, is one example. Yes, yes Gunnar. Time, Time to go. go? No, uh -huh. well, yeah, but uh, <laughs> but also the well, question like, what what is the uh, kind of like the support for Java running on those devices? I know that on the Raspberry Pi you can run, you know, like you want to run your embedded Tomcat server. Yeah, yeah, very good question. So Raspberry Pi will obviously run Java and it has a nice GPIO library. You can do everything with Java that I've seen. I've not found any limitations with Java. Um, but, you can, but this guy, the Edison, doesn't run Java so much just yet <laughs> that I've seen. Uh, it pretty much is in more night. Uh, you know, C++ land, Python node. Uh, is the Edison x86 or ARM? This is definitely x86. It's Intel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but so I think that's a, uh, that's a very fair question. The, the, um, when it comes to Java in particular, you can run Java on a lot of these devices. You can't run them on them all. And partly, my understanding is it's a licensing issue. You know, you, in order to run uh, Node.js or Python on something, you pay nobody. Right? If you want to run Java on the thing and call it a certified component for that, you've got to pay somebody. And so that's limiting the access of Java on a lot of these devices. At least that's the story that I've been hearing from various parties. What about Go and Rust? Rust and Go? Well, Go is great for like systems engineering. So if you're going to build Kubernetes, that's Go as an example. Um, but I don't know if I'd build business logic in Go. And I've not looked at Rust at all. I, it's an up and comer, I know. But you know, there'll be a new language next month, too. Yeah. <laughs> what about Ceylon? Yeah, what about Ceylon? <laughs> we sponsor Ceylon as a language development project within Red Hat also. So there's just a ton of you know, language development going on out there. All right, well, thank you guys very much for your time. If you have other questions, I'm here for a while longer. You can certainly ask me. <laughs> <laughs>